Good. Well, I was going to say good evening, everybody. That's good evening for you. It's good morning for me here in New Zealand. It's uh, eight o'clock, just past eight o'clock. So um, not too bad, actually. I, at least I didn't have to get up at five o'clock. I've got a meeting tomorrow that starts at five o'clock, which is going to be a bit interesting because I won't be in a house. So I'll be out in the field somewhere. But um, anyway, for those of you who want to check me out, um, if you remember the phrase around the world in 80 Wales, then ATW, ATW, you can find me on Facebook and also on Instagram. But I must admit on Instagram, there's not a lot of photographs up there at the moment. I need to get those sorted out, but um, you'll find me there. So um, I'm really lucky in that I go out on cruises and give talks on cruise ships about wildlife. Um, I retired early in 19, no, I didn't, not 1980. When was it? It was um, in 2018 and uh, retired from BDMLR. And uh, the idea there was just to travel the world and see as much as I could see, as many whales and dolphins as I could see. And I started doing cruises with uh, Viking. And this is the cruise that I'm currently on or, or just finished. So we started in Mumbai on November the 14th, uh, got to Bangkok on the 29th. Then we left there, another cruise down to Bali uh, and got there on December the 11th. Then from Bali, we went via Komodo and then around Australia uh, down to Sydney. Then I had a month off in Australia doing my own thing, just hired a car and drove. And then uh, I rejoined the ship when it came back to Sydney and went over to uh, New Zealand, up to Auckland, and then went stayed on it and went back to Sydney. Then I flew back to New Zealand from uh, Sydney, and now I'm here for, uh, what, about five weeks in total. So I'm in the North Island at the moment, but uh, in about a week's time, I'll be flying down to the South Island to do some motorbiking, some exploration there as well, which would be fantastic. So I'm very lucky that I can do this because obviously all my flights are covered and um, I just have a great time on ship and see a lot of people there and get to see a lot of wildlife as well. This is the ship. This is the Viking Mars. So Viking has a number of ocean ships. They're all exactly the same. And um, this is my office, if you like. This is the uh, the deck that I work from. So every morning I would give a I would host a, a wildlife watching program for about two hours from seven fifteen in the morning till nine fifteen. People come out and join me through breakfast and ha have a lot of fun. I don't know if you can see my arrow here, the cursor, but uh, this here is the bridge with the wings, and then my little office is that deck just above it you can see a sloping line of um, glass there and that's where we actually do this from and then later in the day I would give a um, a talk as well about something it might be about specific wildlife like albatross or whales and dolphins or whatever or it might be an ecological based based one but it means that my days on the ship are a little bit different from what you might encounter if you're going out with a group say from HWDT or from Orca or whoever who are out there doing surveys because obviously you've got a team of people doing their, uh, doing that and you're out all day recording stuff. Uh, when it's just little on me, I'm out there, I get tired, so I'm not out there all the time and very often I'll get guests saying, did you see this, did you see that? And if I'd looked out of my uh, cabin window or cabin balcony, then yes, I would, but very often I'll miss stuff as well. So I'm not going to see as much as I would do if I was actually part of a team uh, that's out there. So bear that in mind. This is my little camper van that I'm in at the moment. It's quite a sweet little thing. Um, I'm actually, well, I'm not there at the moment. I'm actually in somebody's house. Somebody's hosting me at the moment, but this is what I'm driving around in at the moment. And that's, uh, that's just a bit of fun from what I'm doing now. So let's have a look at um, some of the photographs that I've taken. This is um, a recorded uh, program. So basically my hands are off now. I'm not touching anything. So I've got to talk about whatever comes up on the screen. So cetaceans we're starting with and common dolphins. We had a lot of these all the way down um, on every single section of the cruise. Uh, all of these are photographs that I took from uh, that deck that you saw. So um, got a pretty good camera but common dolphins are called common because they're common to all of the oceans around the world 
and uh, these were the main dolphin that we had. We also had uh, bottlenose dolphins, which I think are coming up in a second, or maybe not yet, another second, another few seconds. Oh, sorry, here. So this is a, a dusky dolphin and common dolphin mixed pod. So this is off the coast of New Zealand. Here's a bottlenose dolphin as well. Uh, so bottlenose dolphins we had on a number of occasions, uh, not all the time. We also had, I didn't get any photographs of them, but we had grey spinner dolphins. Uh, and uh, that was basically it from the smaller dolphins. But we did get some of the larger dolphins or the blackfish as uh, we call them, the blackfish family, uh, because we had some longfin pilot whales. So longfin pilot whales, these were, again, off the coast of Australia. I was hoping to see orca. Unfortunately, I didn't see any. We had orca around the ship when we were moored in Auckland. So I'm going to go back and do a whale watching trip in Auckland. Um, and a lot, of cust a lot of the customers, a lot of the guests saw those, but I was stuck in my cabin working on talks. So I didn't get to see them. Uh, we also had some beaked whales unidentified because, as you know, they're not that easy to see. Um, Hector's dolphin here. Uh, oh, slipped in after the pilot whales there. But Hector's dolphin off the coast of New Zealand, down around um, uh, Littleton and around there. Beautiful, beautiful animals, uh, obviously fairly endangered. Their cousins, the Maui dolphins, are far more endangered. There are very few of those. And in terms of the big whales, then, yeah, we had a few sperm whales. And uh, we also had an unidentified, uh, oh, there's a log, there's a common log. Um, we also had a fin whale, we think, and possibly a brood as well. We had other marine mammal sightings as well. So this is New Zealand sea lion, and uh, this is quite a large animal. Um, they are quite aggressive as well, the sea lions, far more aggressive than our seals in the UK. And obviously these are different because these can sit back on their haunches and actually run at you and along the beach. But we also have New Zealand fur seal, and these are much smaller. These The females here are about a metre and a half long. Um, and these have much more pointed uh, snouts than the fur seals. And there's a good number of these down there. Uh, these were off the coast of Dunedin. I actually went out to see them at a place called Nature's World. So the pups are there. They're running around. This little fellow was trying to find his mum, but his mum wasn't there. So he was just going up to every female and saying, please can I have some milk. And all the females were telling him where to go, basically. Um, and they can get quite aggressive. Apparently they can kill other pups if they harass the mothers, harass the females too much. But um, there were quite a few youngsters there all just playing in the in the water there. Um, and as you can imagine, it was pretty smelly as well. But Nature's World was a great run place. It's a fantastic farm, basically. And he's got a penguin beach where humans haven't set foot on the beach for about 30 years. Uh, so totally, con totally conservation minded. And a lot of the uh, documentaries that we see from New Zealand about wildlife are actually taken at Nature's World because they have so much going on. There's a female that isn't the mother of the pup telling the pup where to go. Uh, but you can see these huge, huge flippers on the front, uh, which they are quite different from the ones that we have. Now, larger animals as well. When we were in Sri Lanka, uh, we saw Sri Lankan elephants. These look wild, but these are actually orphans. And there's an orphanage that we went to. Uh, it took animals that were orphans of working elephants. Obviously, an elephant gives birth. The owner doesn't want that elephant because the youngster, because it takes money to actually pay them. So these would take them in. All of these now are pretty large. You can see a little one there that's born in the uh, in the sanctuary. The only training that these animals go through now is basically to walk through the town down to the river to have their swim. And it's absolutely fantastic. Difference between the African elephant and the Asian elephants. This is a, a subspecies of the Asian elephant. You can see on the head, it actually has two cranial humps on the head, whereas the African elephant only has one. Uh, the tusks, you'd say, are smaller, but I've seen some huge tuskers out there. But the main thing here with the Sri Lankan elephant is this freckling that you get on the uh, on the snout, on the, the trunk. Here we go, and on the forehead. And the older they get, the more orange it gets and the more um, uh, pigmented it seems to be. But beautiful, beautiful coloration, absolutely stunning animals. And it's, uh, it's a wonderful thing to see. But very friendly animals. As I say, it's a good orphanage. 
the orphans are big, but they do allow to them, them to breed. That's why you see some much younger animals is there, there as well. And I was asking them why they allowed them to breed. And they said, well, we're Buddhists and we believe that animals should be allowed to do whatever they want to do wherever they are. And that's a very, very difficult um, argument to, to counter. There's some water buffalo there as well. And also on uh, when we come to the Komodo dragons, these were living very close to Komodo dragons and uh, predated on by the Komodo dragons as well. Monkeys in Asia, we have the long-tailed macaque, and you can see why it's called a long-tailed macaque, incredibly long. Um, macaques are monkeys, they're not apes, although people call them apes, in fact, because some of the species do have tails, um, they are monkeys. And these we can see in most of the gardens out there um, and the, uh, the parks. They'll obviously come around humans. Humans love feeding them. It's not a good thing because then they can become a little bit aggressive, but they're always good to see and always good to, uh, to take photographs of as well. And then another species that we have is the black-faced langur. Um, this is just the one photograph of this, I think, uh, but you see quite a few of those around. Now, this is an island, and this was in Malaysia. Quite an interesting island, because when we go off the boat to get in, we were put in a cage. So we had to wander through this cage and the wildlife were on the outside of the cage and that protected them from us and the animal that they were um, looking after there and rehabilitating were wild animals that had had problems and these were the orangutans. So they are actually brought in from Sumatra. They would live on the island. Uh, we didn't see any females because the females had their young and they were isolated in different parts of the island. This is BJ, who's the big alpha male, very, very aggressive animal. Uh, one of the reasons for the cage uh, to keep us safe, but also obviously to keep us away from passing on zoonotic diseases to the animals as well. But beautiful animals um, and pretty well cared for, cared for. I was very, very impressed. And they had a very high um, success rate with births and a lot of uh, the rehabilitations, all of the animals there will be rehabilitated, rehabilitated at some time, apart from one male who is about the same size as BJ, the alpha male, but we think that he was gay. He hasn't shown any interest in females at all, so he's probably not going to go back into the wild. He's quite happy just sitting there and watching things. But Malaysia was full of this palm oil, 72% uh, of the um, land is covered in palm oil production and they love it. And whenever you talk to people about conservation, they will say, yeah, we don't have tigers, we don't have the bears, we don't have the um, orangutans anymore. It's because of development. They don't actually link it with the uh, deforestation that's going on there. One mammal that you do see out there is the Malaysian flying fox. Big, big animal. These have a wingspan of, uh, I think it's about five foot. In fact, absolutely massive. And during the daytime, they're just going to be hanging uh, upside down. And this is a little red flying fox. This was in Casino in Australia when I was out there. Uh, and about 80,000 of these fly in every year. And the place is really, really noisy. Very, very smelly as well. Now to marsupials. So being in Australia, obviously we have the marsupials and we're gonna start off with the koala bear, which, sorry, mustn't call it koala bear. It's not a bear at all, koala. Um, we had a lot of these, but in the sanctuaries, I didn't see any in the wild. These were photographed in the sanctuaries as well. Obviously they feed on eucalyptus leaves, only four species of eucalyptus, and there are quite a few hundred species. Oh, the claws there, the first and second toe, are fused together to help them grow and groom, which I never realized. But they have very small brains because of the toxins in the eucalyptus leaves, but they will smell the leaves and eat the least toxic. But they sleep for up to 20 hours a day, and that helps them to actually digest the toxins as well. And they have this cartilaginous pad on their bottom. There we go. And that means that they can actually sit there and rest without getting bum sores. Um, and uh, obviously one of the problems there is when people pick them up and start petting them because that breaks their cycle. So it's not a, a good thing at all. Another marsupial of, of kangaroos. So I have a few of those. This is the red kangaroo, the largest kangaroo uh, in Australia. And that could be nine foot from the tip of the nose to the tip of the tail. 
Um, and while we're just going through these, I'll throw something else in about marsupials that, well, oh, it's not early in the morning for you, it's evening, I can talk about this, but they actually have bifurcated penises. The, uh, the males, they actually have two heads to their penis because the female actually has, well, three vaginas, basically. The central one is for giving birth to the little joey, and then the two on the side are actually for receiving the sperm from the males. And this is another fact that I didn't know until I started talking to the keepers at these places. So that now has become part of one of my talks. And uh, of course, audiences love hearing about those sort of things. There's the little Joey um, living in the pouch. So he's getting a bit big now. He'll be out. But kangaroos and wallabies can have three Joeys at a time. So they can have a brand new little Joey that just come out and into the uh, into the pouch. They can also have one that has been there for a while suckling and they'll have one that's outside as well so that they could have three at a time. We have wallabies as well, much smaller ones. These were taken out in the bush uh, at a campsite that I was at, in fact. And it's great when you get to camp with animals like this. They've all got these big, thick tails and they use the tails to actually store fat. So that provides them with um, goodness when times are a little bit rough. Tassie devil, again, these are in a sanctuary. There's, you're not gonna see these in the wild that easily. This is a little blind one, but uh, this is a Bonnerong sanctuary on Tasmania. Again, a really, really well run um, place. And I thought International Fund for Animal Welfare helped to fund it. And whenever I see their logo, I know that it's a good place because they won't fund a bad uh, a bad unit at all. Potteroo, this was in a, in a dark house. So uh, they a lot of the marsupials are actually um, nocturnal. So you're only going to see them if they're in a dark house and uh, they have those sort of things here. Now the monotremes, these are the echidna and the platypus. Here we see echidna. Now these little um, red things on this one, I think there's some blue ones on some of the spines here, this one. These are to actually identify the individual animals in the uh, rescue centres. Now echidnas and platypus actually have a four-pronged penis, but only two of them work at a time. Um, just another little thing. You can tell the sort of talks that I give on, on cruise ships. And that's the only platypus I saw. So I didn't see one in the wild at all. Now onto the reptiles. And we had reptiles all the way down the, uh, the, the trip. So this is an Asian water monitor. This was in uh, Malaysia, I think. Big, big animals. These can be up to four foot long, uh, really they're all around, but they're quite difficult to see. So this one was just in somebody's garden as I was walking past their house, just, just there. This is a changeable lizard. I'm not sure why it's called changeable. Um, it doesn't seem to change colour. But what I love, you can see these um, little pits on the back of its head. And I think this is, oh, you can't see it on that one, but uh, you'll see it on another one. Oh, yeah, you can just see that one there. But it's almost like a bit of camouflage because it makes the head look as if those are the nostrils. And uh, if birds are flying in, then they'll go for the back of the head rather than the front and be a little bit a little bit surprised by them. This is a little baby. This one was tiny. It was only about two centimetres long, absolutely tiny. But thankfully, the camera picked it up. Somebody pointed it out to me. It took me 10 minutes to actually see it myself uh, purely because it was so small. But you have to keep your eyes peeled when you're out there. Australian water dragon. So in Australia, you have a lot of reptiles, as I say, uh, a lot of the uh, dragons and uh, a lot of the monitors as well. So all of these are slightly different, slightly different ecologies. Now, snake alert. If you don't like snakes, look away. We had a sea snake as well. Didn't see any land snakes at all, uh, but we did have a few sea snakes when we were actually at sea. Okay, you can look back now. And uh, the biggest animal out there, the biggest reptile on earth, saltwater crocodile, um, he measures up to about 13 foot long, I think. And I went on a couple of trips up the river. This was in the Adelaide River, which isn't in Adelaide, strange enough, it's in the north coast. Uh, so we went out from Darwin to see these big, big crocs and quite uh, aggressive as well. Now, they do this uh, feeding where they go out and they feed the animals and they'll jump up. This is one particular animal. You can see how the teeth here have grown through the uh, the top of the muzzle as well. Very, very 
strange and I'm, I'm sure that must have hurt when it started growing through a bit of toothache but these are big animals quite dangerous this is an animal called Casanova and he's the alpha male and when Casanova turns up all of the others disappear and you can see he is a big ugly brute I don't know what that blood came from but he has been known to fight off his suitors but also he's been known to kill his girlfriends as well which um isn't the best sort of thing. I don't think that's going to further his genes if he actually kills his girlfriends off. Uh, but we spent quite a lot, a lot of time with Casanova. And in fact, one of the guests fainted uh, as soon as his name was mentioned. We don't know whether that was because of his name or she was just enamoured by him or whatever. Actually, she got low blood pressure and she just passed out in the heat. Um, but we had to cut this trip short to actually get her back to shore fairly quickly. Uh, but we did spend a bit of time with the croc here with uh, this big. You can see a few of the teeth there he's lost. Incidentally, the difference between crocodiles and alligators is that crocodiles actually have the fourth tooth on the bottom jaw protruding. So you see those outside, whereas alligators, they actually go inside and get into a pit. So that's a good way of, of watching them. This is a freshwater crocodile, much slimmer animal. The eyes are much closer to head as well, a much longer snout as well. And these are generally much tamer and, uh, or let's say they're a bit more docile than the salt waters. But even so, I still wouldn't, wouldn't want to mess with one. Um, these come up on um, golf courses as well. So you can have a little bit of, you can get a little bit too close to them. Now, the smaller animals, uh, these are all various skinks. Uh, some of them actually have legs, some of them don't. The legless skink, skink obviously doesn't. But there again, you can see that some of these have fat tails. And again, this is where they will store their goodness as well. But skinks are great at getting rid of little invertebrates. So they do a good job of getting rid of all the little um, ticks and mites and little buzzy things that you don't want around. Bearded dragons. Uh, beautiful, beautiful animal to see a bearded dragon. I wanted to see a, a, a frilled uh, lizard as well, but we didn't see a frilled lizard. But this is a very, very close uh, relative to that as well. Don't know what this one was. He was just there, so took his photograph. And then onto the big boy. So this is Komodo dragon. We went to an island in the Komodo Islands. So the dragon is actually called Komodo because of the islands where it was first seen. This is actually on Rinka Island, which I think is better than Komodo because it's less commercialized. Uh, there is a walkway that you walk across. You can't get down to the dragons, uh, but there are huge, huge animals there. Um, again, they're really long. I think it's up to about 12 foot long. And these are some old relics from the really old uh, lizards that have been out there from the monitor family as well. But you can see that very square, rectangular size head. Uh, we saw a couple fighting. Unfortunately, I didn't get the camera ready or I did have the camera ready, but I had too many guests in front of me. That's another problem with me going out with guests. Um, I'm there to talk about wildlife, not take the photographs. So you have to elbow your way to the front to get the photographs. Uh, but look at that forked tongue. It's flicking around, just tasting the air all the time. Uh, and the youngsters, in fact, spend uh, about three years up in the trees. So once they've hatched and they're actually, uh, they become uh, lizards, they'll then go up in the trees, they'll come down to eat. This one's gone for a little swim, found something in this lake, and then he comes out to devour it. But as soon as he's eaten, he's going to go back up a tree. For the simple reason that they are cannibalistic. So the bigger animals will prey on them as well. And you'll see, I mentioned water buffalo and deer as well. You'll see deer and water buffalo just lying beside the Komodo dragons because the Komodo dragons hunt by stealth. They'll just pretend to be asleep or they'll just creep up very, very slowly. And then eventually they'll bite an animal and the fluids that go into the, uh, that are pumped into the wound eventually will kill the animal because it will just bleed out. It will bleed to death. So the dragons will just wait for it. Now, this is Tuatara. Really interesting. This is not a lizard. This is actually a living dinosaur. So it's the only relic of its family, of its order. And the rest of them died out 60 million years ago. This one remained. So there are very few of these, mainly on the outlying islands that are predator free. Um, and they have this very distinctive yellow spines down the back, or the older ones do. We can see a youngster 
dog that was a youngster, but um, yeah, fascinating animals. And we had a lot of turtles on the trip as well, particularly on the north of um, Australia. Now onto just a couple of amphibians. It's the white dumpty tree frog. I love the word dumpty because he certainly was a, a dumpty tree frog. And uh, the only other one I saw was a green tree frog here, uh, which just presented his backside to me. He wouldn't turn around or whatever I did. Arachnids and insects. Obviously, we're taking photographs of little small things as well. Very quick through here because the spiders, I don't know, there are too many. I mean, I'm not, I should be into these, but there are over 2 million insects. Um, oh, the Australian mantis. I do know there are 118 species of mantis in Australia, 2,400 in the world. So there's no way I'm going to identify those individually. And of course, cicadas, that's the sound that you can hear in Australia and New Zealand all the time. And then various butterflies. This is a beautiful one, the wanderer. Um, this is a yellow butterfly. I'm not sure what sort. And just a, a few little ones there as well. Now onto the birds. And here we have plenty of birds. So uh, we started off black, black capped black capped kingfisher in uh, Malaysia. And the Brahmani kite. Now there were many Brahmani kites. Uh, down by the river. Some of them were actually feeding. They were catching fish from the top of the river as well. Dead fish, not live fish. We saw one actually pick up a rat from the river as well, and they all started fighting on it. It's a grey-headed fish eagle, and our guide, local guide at the moment said, you've got to be very careful uh, because ospreys are very often confused with fish eagles, and this is an osprey. And I thought, well, yeah, they are very easily confused because this isn't an osprey. This is an osprey. So we saw the fish eagle. But he called it an osprey. So unfortunately, local guides don't always get it particularly right. This one was on top of a uh, power cable, just eating a fish. You can see he's, he's thrown out some part that he didn't want. And then we had a lot of egrets and herons as well. So the great egret that you'll be aware of in the UK, the little egret as well, uh, quite a few of these. And... Um, there you go, another one. And these would be in, in any waterway, any fresh waterway that we saw, and a lot of the estuaries as well. And of course, there are cattle egret out there with us as well. So good number of these all around and beautiful birds. And of course, these now we're seeing in the UK as well as our climate's changing. Bassian thrush. Uh, took me about five hours to discover what that was. It was just a thrush. This bird I never identified. It's uh, on a wattle. I don't know if it's a wattle bird, but I uh, didn't give it a name. And then the Eurasian thick knee. Now, when I was in the Gambia last year, uh, one of our guys kept saying, talking about a tick knee, a tick knee all the while. And I thought, what's a tick knee? And of course, it was a thick knee. So very similar to our stone curlew, the same sort of family, uh, but beautiful birds. And this was just in a car park, in fact, by a toilet. I came out of the toilet and he was there. And I always carry a camera when I go into the toilet. Lots of little birds as well, little finches like the Munia. And of course, out at sea, we had quite a few turns. So this is a great crested turn uh, that would have been in Australia. Now, the gull that we saw most of was the silver or the red-billed gull. So in Australia, it's called silver gull. In New Zealand, it's called the red-billed gull. There's also a black-billed gull as well, but this is probably the, the commonest gull uh, that we saw around uh, in, in the south in the Antipodes. Orange-footed scrub fowl, as you can imagine, this lives in the scrub and it's got orange legs. Clever naming there. Uh, so this is one of the megapods, the large feet uh, birds, and these just scrub around in the scrub, in fact. Uh, looking for invertebrates and just eating whatever they can find. But this is in Darwin, um, just in a in a botanical garden. <clears throat> also see magpie larks, both in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, beautiful birds, slightly different males and females. This is a female, has more white above the beak. The male that you saw before didn't. And a satin bowerbird. This was deep in a forest when I was camping. This is a female. I uh, didn't see the male at all. I could hear the male because they were scrubbling around in the, uh, in the growth. But uh, look at that beautiful purple eye. And again, in Australia, magpie goose. So obviously they do have magpies, which are actually more like crows. 
Uh, but these are quite common. You'll see these in most of the parks again here. They're just coming into land in one of the parks in Darwin. Uh, but large, large bird, very, very noisy and uh, can be quite aggressive when they've got chicks with them. And a big, really big bird, Australian pelican. So the largest pelican in the world. Um, its beak can hold, uh, oh, what is it? No, I'm not going to go there because I can't remember how. Oh, no, it is. It's something like 27 pints um, of water in its mouth when it's actually fishing. The white pelicans actually feed from the surface. So they just dip down their heads and feed from the surface. It's the grey pelicans around the world that actually dive from height into, into the uh, ocean. But we had these very close to the ship. Uh, and uh, you can see a male and a female there. Uh, <clears throat> but... Great birds to see, uh, very, well, they weren't that active, actually. They were resting most of the time. Had a lot of parrots family, so the red-tailed black cockatoo is getting, uh, well, it's highly protected in Australia now. There you can see the red tail there. Not as common as it used to be, um, but if you're lucky, you can see them out in the wild. Obviously, the, the one that you see most of the time is the galar which I didn't get any photographs of, but I did get something similar, sulfur-crested, self, self I can't say that, sulfur-crested cockatoo. And these were all around as well. So wherever we went, we'd hear these, we'd see them, quite cheeky birds. They would come and take your crisps. Um, I stopped a couple from feeding them crisps because obviously you don't want to feed birds anything that's salty. Uh, but they are beautiful birds and uh, very, very noisy, as are quite a few of the birds out there. Rainbow lorikeet, very common indeed. Uh, plenty of these all around the uh, parks and gardens and a joy to see. They're really, really beautifully coloured. And the next one, I think, is the uh, that we can see is the crimson rosella. If that comes up now. Here we go, crimson rosella. Uh, so crimson rosella is, again, very highly protected. This is being kicked out of its um, out of its roost, out of its uh, tree trunk nests by the miner. We'll see an Indian miner in, the moment, in, a, in a while. Indian miner was introduced, and this is a big, big problem for the rosella, sadly. Now, this is the mask lapwing or plover or the spurwing plover. And it's called spurwing because of these curious little spurs that it's got. Some of them have on their wings. These are actually bony, so they come out of the ulna and they are used to actually spar with as well. So males and females both have them. Um, not all of them have them. You can just see one there on that outstretched wing there. But really weird. A lot of plovers apparently have that um, around the world. I didn't realize that until I saw this species and started learning about it. Uh, but yeah, a number of uh, plovers have those really, really weird little spurs on them, but very aggressive birds. Uh, these ones had chicks, so they were flying at us and attacking us. Christmas Island frigate bird. Frigate bird is probably my favorite seabird out there. We didn't see any males because the males would have been in their rookeries actually trying to attract females by bellowing and uh, inflating their, <clears throat> their big red pouches, as I'm sure you've seen on a lot of David Attenborough's programs. Uh, but these would accompany us uh, for quite a few miles. Uh, these were near Christmas Island, so this is off the north coast of Australia. Uh, these are the main species that are there, but we did get some little frigate birds as well. We didn't get the greats and we didn't get the magnificents on this trip, but I've had those elsewhere. And of course, we had some boob boobies. So the boobies are very similar to the gannets, the same family. Um, and the brown booby there is the one that is the main bird that was with us in Asia, certainly. Um, flying around, settled down on the deck occasionally. But when I've been in Central America, we've had a lot of these. And coming down the coast of South America, um, you know, we can have huge flocks of those just riding on the air bubble that um, the ship makes. Now onto the cormorants. So there are a number of little cormorants here, or uh, big cormorants as well. Now cormorants, their feather, feathers aren't waterproof. They actually do get waterlogged. That's why you'll see them out there holding their wings to dry. And that's so that they can dive and actually catch fish underwater. Um, their 
Nostrils are actually on the inside of their beak as well, so that they don't take water in when they're diving. Uh, but we had a lot of different species, black-faced and little pied cormorants as well. Now onto the fabulous, fabulous birds, the albatross. You'd imagine down there we're going to get albatross. These are wandering albatross, so that was a juvenile. This is a, an adult. This is part of a group of albatross. This may well be the snowy wandering albatross. I think, I think it probably is. They tend to be a bit whiter than the other ones in the albatross or the wandering albatross complex uh, with birds. If you get a number of birds that are similar, it's called complex. So these are birds from the wandering albatross complex. Uh, this is a shy albatross, um, <clears throat> probably a Tasmanian shy, I think. Uh, so we had Tasmanian shies and we had Auckland shies as well, very, very similar and uh, quite large birds. Salvins, which is a good bird to see. These are basically from the mollyhawk uh, group. So they're a bit stubbier bodies, uh, a little bit shorter wings. But again, if you're out on a cruise ship in the Antipodes, you're going to be um, gathering some of these just flying beside you all the time. And they are fantastic to see even if you don't see any whales and dolphins. And as I say, we didn't see enough whales and dolphins on this trip, but we had hundreds of shy albatross. And I think in the end, we had about seven or eight different species. Now these will fly around the polar region, as you know, Northern Royal Albatross, this is down at Dunedin. And uh, this is one little chick. You can see one little chick there. I'm gonna go back there in a couple of months time because the other chicks should have hatched now. That was an early one. Um, this is a Bullis albatross. And of course, they can fly around. Well, they've been recorded. Uh, the Royal Albatross has been recorded. One of them was recorded for flying for four months without actually landing on the sea. And when they hatch, when they fledge, the young will actually stay at sea for four years before they come back to their uh, where, they, uh, where they were born or where they, they hatched. We had a lot of shearwaters with us as well. Lots of different species. This is a wedge tailed. We also had short tailed. Uh, we had the saw the bullers earlier. Um, great birds to see. <clears throat> and these we would see when there's uh, a lot of bad weather because they get the uplift. Now, here we've got an albatross and a dolphin. If you look to the right hand side of the screen, if you can see it, uh, there's a dolphin in there. And the great petrel, which is trying its best to be an albatross, but it's just too ugly. It just is not an albatross. It does try. It's a big bird, but it's got, oh, I'm sorry, it's just not pretty. This is pretty. The little fairy prion. In fact, that may not be a fairy prion, but certainly this one is. Um, so these were the little birds that were, uh, we'd see those very much on the leeward side. So they'd be protected from the wind and they'd fly down uh, out to sea with us that way, um, but not on the side that was taking the, the wind. This again was in Bonnerong. Uh, in the sanctuary in uh, Tasmania, tawny frogmouth, just sitting on logs during the day, doing nothing in particular, just sitting around looking like a log. Great birds to see. And we had ducks. So the main duck that we saw, there were quite a few teal, but wood ducks that nest in holes in the trees as well. And then when the chicks hatch, and when they come out, they just fall down, basically. And then the parents, this is a male on the right, female on the left, have a pretty difficult job actually just looking after them and keeping them away from predators because they, um, you know, they can't get back up to the nest. Then the Australasian, Australasian gannet, very similar to our gannets uh, up here in the North Atlantic or where you are now. Uh, and this was a big rookery. So they, they had, or sorry, gannetry. I think there were 20,000 of them in total, spread across five uh, little groups. And uh, these parents would go out to sea. They'd be bringing fish back. They would be digesting the food while they're at sea. They might be out there for a few days. When they get back, the youngster just sticks his beak right down the throat of the uh, adult causing it to regurgitate and of course that food comes up and it's already semi-digested already but if you have a look at this yeah I think I would regurgitate anything if I had that in my mouth as well. 
um, quite aggressive birds. Sadly, some of the really fluffy ones probably aren't going to survive. It's a bit late in the season. This one's okay because it's, it's mother's feeding it, but we did see some that were very, very dehydrated on a very hot day, and they probably wouldn't um, wouldn't last. But that sadly is the life out there uh, in the real world. When they come into land, the gannets basically put the brakes on. So the wings go out, the feet go down, and then they just drop out of the sky. And it's great to be able to take photographs like that because they do actually stall. They do actually hold there and you're going bang, 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 click, click, click. And then when they land, they just lose it totally. Um, they do not land gracefully uh, on the land. Now, a lot of gannet trees are usually in cliffs. These are actually on the surface of the uh, of the land. So uh, we see a lot of this crash landing going on. Great fun to watch. But big birds, a little bit smaller than ours. So ours have a wingspan of about two meters. Um, they're going to be about one and one and three quarter meters. black bat gull or the kelp gull in Australia is one of the main predators of the chicks at those gannet trees. This is Indian minor that I was talking about, introduced bird, um, and it is classed as a pest in Australia. There's a noisy minor, which is actually indigenous, uh, which is a speckled one, and those are okay, but this one is doing a bad problem, a, a bad job on looking after some of the bird sites. Black-faced ibis, also called the, uh, the dumpster duck and the bin chicken, and the tipster turkey, the tip turkey, because they feed on all of the um, rubbish that comes out of waste bins. You'll see them. That beak is absolutely perfectly evolved to go into waste bins and take food out. And then we have the takahay. Now, the takahay, there are only about 200 of these on the island. So this, again, is in a sanctuary. Large, large birds. These were thought to be extinct. And then uh, a couple were found on the South Island in 1948. And they've had a breeding program from there, and they've actually started breeding them now and releasing them to the wild. Tui is the bird in New Zealand that you're going to hear singing in the background. Beautiful bird. It's also called the Parsons bird because of that, those little white tufts of uh, feathers on their chin. But this is the one that you'll hear along with the bellbird. We'll see a bellbird in a little while. The Karuru is a big, big bird. So this is bigger than our wood pigeons, but stunning colours. Really, really lovely birds. And when they fly off, um, they just crash through the leaves. So they make such a, an incredible noise as they're flying off. Uh, but beautiful birds to see. And uh, here we come. The, the uh, Piwakiwaka or the New Zealand fantail. These do not stop displaying. The males are always flicking their tails up. Um, beautiful birds. They come in. They're quite aggressive as well. So if you're standing close to a nest or, or it's displaying to a female, it's going to come in very close to you and just keep flicking that tail up, uh, which is uh, a great, great thing to see. Here we go. Flicky, flicky. The little fantails. Australia has fantails as well. Uh, but as I say, these were actually taken in New Zealand. And here's the bellbird. So the bellbird really does sound like a Bell. I can't do an impersonation, but it just sounds like somebody hitting a bell. North Island robin. Uh, it's not a robin, actually. Strange enough, it's it's just called North North Island robin. Does look like it. The kaka. This is a young kaka. So the kaka is a forest parrot. Uh, this is one of the flying parrots. Obviously, they've got some that don't fly, like the the kakapu, which we didn't see, but brightly coloured. Um, if you get close up enough, you can see that coloration of them. They also have kia. I didn't actually see kia, but the kia are the mountain birds that actually live up uh, on the ski slopes as well and cause a lot of problems up there. Um, California quail. This was at Hobbiton because uh, I did go and visit the stage set of Hobbiton and these were wandering around as well. I didn't, don't remember seeing them in the film, uh, but uh, beautiful bird to see. And some more terns, fairy terns. This is mixed flock fairy terns and silver gulls as well. Lots of terns actually staying with us uh, going around. And surprise for me, royal spoonbills that were nesting at Dunedin as well. And the penguins. So little blue or fairy penguin, depending on where you are. 
Now, Australia and New Zealand both have them. You can see here on the eye, the eye looks really, really quite fierce. And that's because their pupils or their, their eyes are adapted for seeing underwater. So they allow a lot of light in. So when they're actually out in the open air, you'll see that the pupil is really contracted. So they're letting as little light in as possible because they don't want to damage uh, their retina. But these now are molting. So these are, you get the young chicks that are getting rid of their fluffy feathers. And you also get the adults that are getting rid of their breeding plumage and they're now going into their winter plumage down here. Because of course, down here, we're coming to the end of summer. So beautiful birds to see. I'm um, just keeping an eye on time. We're going to be okay, I think. Um, but uh, as I say, it's hands off. So I'm just letting it do what it's doing. But I know that this is the penultimate bird because the bird that I want to finish with is coming up here. The laughing kookaburra. I've got to finish on this basically because this is the archetypal uh, Australian bird. Beautiful bird. This is a, a basically a forest kingfisher. They're large birds. They are incredibly friendly. And I made friends with quite a few of these on the cap sites. They're looking for little scraps. Of course, in Australia and New Zealand, you just don't leave anything out anyway because you don't want to add that sort of pollution to, to anything and you don't want to get birds coming too close to you. Um, but these are very, very cheeky birds. Their laughter is the resounding sound in most of the woodlands and the forests in uh, Australia. and. Uh, as I say, they come really close. This one just missed me to catch that cicada. And here you can see one looking down on the Viking Mars, the ship that I was out on. So I took that before I joined the Viking Mars uh, for the second time in Sydney as it went out to sea after I'd come off it. So that's the final slide. So I hope that you've been able to...